everyone welcome back to my channel my name is Claire and I hope that everybody is staying safe and washing their hands and not touching their face <laughs> and doing their best during this time of extreme quarantine and social isolation I'm definitely aiming to put out more videos because a I have the time and b because I'm watching a lot more content because I have so much more time on my hands so I imagine some of you are in the same boat let me know down below that you're, what you're doing with all your spare time if you're working from home, if you're reading more, what you're reading. If you hear something, Yukon has been very clingy to me today and he's chewing on one of his bones right now. So apologies for the noise, but it also looks really adorable. So I don't want to take the bone away from him. <laughs> today, I wanted to talk about the book I most recently finished and that is Sorcery of Thorns. If you've watched any of my weekly reading and writing vlogs, then you've seen some of my thoughts about it already. Um, and if you watched my my cover critique video, then you've seen, you know, how excited I am for this book, basically because of the cover. So I wanted to talk about my feelings because they are so mixed. <laughs> this was such a weird reading experience for me. I'm going to get into some spoilers. If you're planning on reading it, mm, you've been Warned. So let's talk about Margaret Rogenson's YA fantasy Sorcery of Thorns. So like I've mentioned like half a dozen times already, I have heard about this book on like booktube and bookstagram, but my main interest in it, and it's hard to tell because of my ring light, but the cover is just so freaking beautiful. I actually got this book on my birthday. That's how badly I wanted it. So I have been hotly anticipating this read for a while and I decided to read it in February because I heard it was a like romance based book after reading it I can't I would not call this romance based so I don't know if maybe I just wasn't listening to enough sources or the sources I was listening to overhyped the romance because that was something I expected to be a bigger plot line than it was. Let me begin with the premise. So there is this girl, she is an orphan, she has grown up in this magical library where these books known as grimoires, grimoires, they're kind of like the books in Harry Potter where they have personalities and they can move around, say things or sing because they're magical books. Certain grimoires are more dangerous than others others and they require wardens to take them from library to library. If they are not handled properly, they can turn into monsters and kill people. So that whole thing, that whole premise right there is so dope. And I would say the strongest aspect of this book thus far, if that is the only thing you're interested in, then I would say you probably won't be disappointed because I think that aspect is handled incredibly well. I loved the first 100, 150 pages of this book. I was totally absorbed in it. And I think that's because it was so fast paced. We were in the libraries fairly early on. She battles one of these monstrous books. And I think the creature design was really cool, sounded genuinely creepy. And I, I loved the idea of Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that I loved her by the end of the book, not because she did anything wrong, but I had a really hard time connecting to her. She just felt distant. I don't know, there just didn't seem like there was enough to her. She felt very flat. There's a chronic telling versus showing. I think the author does an incredible job with showing locations. It almost made me wonder if she was interested in interior design or architecture or something like that. Because whenever we went to different buildings, she did such a fabulous job describing these very ornate over the top settings or rooms or mansions in a way that felt very grounded and real. But it's like whenever we got to a character, uh, like as beautiful as these buildings are, they're still inanimate. And I felt a similar thing with the characters. It's like we, we got a lot of details, but I never quite, I like never could quite wrestle them into feeling real for me. But one of the things that was told, especially in the beginning of the book, is how much of a rebel Elizabeth is. You know, she never listens to her elders and she's always running off doing her own thing and you get a little bit of that with her first interaction with Nathaniel which I thought was incredibly charming. I love the idea of her <laughs> accidentally 
pushing over like a like a bookshelf and kind of running into him when he's not supposed to. I also was really excited at the idea of the whole enemies to lovers where she hates sorcerers. She's afraid of sorcerers. Nathaniel is a sorcerer. And then you obviously see over time that he's not a bad guy. Sorcery isn't inherently evil. But their relationship felt so rushed almost. You spend a lot of the book with them actually being apart and then, especially in the middle, the middle drove me nuts because A, they were away from each other and it's like, oh, Nathaniel is like the interesting character and pulling Elizabeth away from him just like lost a lot of spark in the story for me. And then it's like they finally get back together, but we're not shown it. It's like we're told that they're spending time together in Nathaniel's study, but we don't get a lot of like actual time. And it's, uh, I don't know, it was it was very frustrating. Another thing, since we're talking about like the, the meat of the plot now, all of these libraries, something bad is happening to them. The, the monsters are coming out of the books. The libraries are being, I wanna say bombed or upheaved in some very dangerous way. People are dying. And there's a ton of libraries throughout this kingdom, these like very important magical libraries, and they're being targeted. And so Elizabeth and Nathaniel are trying to figure out who's doing it. You realize very early on it's Ashcroft, and I just found him to be such a weak villain. He was just a nothing villain. He was just one of those like, I wanna do bad things for power. That doesn't mean anything to me. He also was introduced almost halfway through the story and I wish there was more built up to who Ashcroft was. I just wish that he was introduced, if not physically, then at least by word of mouth <laughs> or something. There was something that connected us to him and connected us in a more grounded way. And he was just so forgettable. I couldn't even really remember what he looked like. I thought his demon, what's her name, Lorelai, was way more interesting. She's hardly in the book at all. If you've ever <laughs> seen the anime um, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, in my mind, she looks exactly like Lust. Just even that visual she turned out to be a disappointing character that didn't do anything but that visual of her is just so much more striking than whatever Ashcroft was and then it's like he's not even the big big bag it's this like super demon monster that's the big bad who's not introduced until what 90% of the way through the book he's barely even he's not even mentioned before that another thing that I did not care for is the demon aspect. I would love to hear if you have read the book, how you feel about the demons. At first, I thought I liked it. And then the further it went on, I was like, not even that I didn't like the concept of it. I just found it took over too much of the plot. I found it also to be kind of confusing and I couldn't get my grasp on how I was supposed to feel about these demons. I think the magic system, I'm not even sure I can relay it properly because it's kind of overly complicated where you can summon a demon and if you know their name, you can pass it along to your children and you offer a certain certain amount of years of your life to this demon and in return the magic that this demon holds also transfers to you so you can know sorcery but you still have to study sorcery and the demon can also just do whatever and it's at your command. I think that was way too complicated. It actually reminds me of Philip Pullman's his Dark Material series, the first book being The Golden Compass, which is what most people know it by. And they also have demons, but it's a part of their soul manifested outside of their body in an animal form. It's basically like they're conscious and it's with them all the time. And I definitely kind of got that vibe. I found it to be way too convoluted of a magic system. And by making this human character that was always there. It just interrupted, one, the romance between Elizabeth and Nathaniel. It felt like there was this third wheel that was always present and kind of taking away from 
the relationship that was building between these two other characters it, I, I found him to be distracting also overpowered like he could do too much and could solve too many of their problems because sometimes he turns into a cat and i'm like okay if he was always in like a cat form that's not as intimidating as like this demonic figure he sometimes turns into but i don't know at least there would be a little bit more distance it was interesting but it was too much for me and even the fact that the book ends on her wanting to summon the what's his name silas back because he basically sacrifices himself before his like demon overlord. That whole thing was a freaking mess. It was a very cinematic climax. It piqued my interest more than anything going on in the middle of the book, just because it was so epic. But on a like actual magic system level, I was just like, what is the fuck is going on? But on like a visual level and like all the, the books and the grimoires going to attack this demon thing and sacrificing themselves, it's like, oh, that's very, that's very sweet. But anyway, so the ending of this book is Elizabeth wanting to resummon Silas back because he, again, sacrificed himself. Ending on that kind of implies that this demon creature is more of the focus and more important to the book than her and Nathaniel. Almost with Wish, the demon creature, Nathaniel's demon, didn't exist or existed in a much more um, tampered down way. And then we focused way more on Elizabeth and Nathaniel, their relationship, and Ash Ashcroft as a or the demon monster or whichever as a villain i always like when we have villains that we can partially sympathize with he was like a caricature of a villain also this book and i mentioned this in my vlog got really preachy especially towards the middle where the author kind of almost stopped the book was talking about her her beliefs. It's not that wanting to push a certain message or a certain agenda is inherently wrong to do with your fiction. <laughs> I just don't like when you stop the story to like yell it at me. It almost feels like you think your readership is too dumb to pick up on what your beliefs are in the text. So you're like, I need to make sure this is said blatantly and said as many times as possible. <laughs> So my readership knows that this is how I feel about certain social issues. But there is one set piece where Elizabeth started working for a different library undercover, although she didn't. <laughs> That's right, she did not change her name. She was like, oh, Elizabeth is a common enough name, despite the fact that I have been in the newspaper and there are pictures of me all over the place. I'm not going to give this institution a different name. I thought that was so dumb. Anyway, but when Elizabeth started working for a different library and there was just some fun things happening in the library itself with the grim the grimoires which again is the strongest aspect of the book another thing that really bothered me maybe this is a taste thing i kept reading and hearing in reviews for sorcery of thorns that people really liked the dialogue and really liked the witty exchanges between characters i thought the dialogue was one of the weakest aspects of the book every line of dialogue went on a little too long to me for something to be witty i think brevity is key and these characters were very winded and just go on and on and on in situations where there's an actual action scene happening or they're sneaking around the library and they need to be quiet and that kept happening where these characters were in situations where either they shouldn't be talking or they need to talk to very quickly because it's a high stakes situation but then they wouldn't it would just go on and on and on and on if they're running for their lives they would maybe be able to get out like a brief sentence not like seven i did not think personally that the dialogue was particularly strong. I think it had witty aspects, but they were not executed very well. They needed somebody to come in and edit it out to actually make it 
funny or interesting. And Elizabeth, <laughs> I'll just say it, she was not witty, she was not funny, she was actually a very boring character, they're really just Nathaniel and his demon. They were the witty ones, but again, not in a particularly well done way, in my opinion. All right, guys, that's gonna wrap up my review of Margaret Rogerson's Sorcery of Thorns. I think on Goodreads, I gave it a three stars, but in my description, I described it as sometimes being a four star read and sometimes being a one star read like I think the quality varies <laughs> throughout the book and if that's something you still want to go through because you're very you're still interested in it by all means do it otherwise I would probably recommend to skip it because there are so many other great books out there and if you want to see what books that I'm currently reading definitely check out my reading and writing vlogs um, that I've been putting up weekly and my Goodreads account. I've been very good at keeping up with it and I'm going to try to be more active on Instagram with what I'm reading and have my own little highlight for that. So if you're interested in the books that I'm consuming, check that out. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!